the Lord, everybody. Let's stand right now. Let's give the Lord some praise right now. All over this house, come on, let's just praise him. Lift your hands, lift your voices, hallelujah. We come into this house to magnify and praise the Lord. I'm glad I have a friend in our God. together now. Oh, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. 
let's worship the Lord. He's our friend. He's our friend. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Many times in our world, things are accomplished because of friends. If you've got friends in influential places in our government, you can get things done. I'm thankful that I've got a friend in God. Hallelujah. He is the best friend that a man or a woman or a young person can have. Amen. Amen. And not only that, not only is he my friend, but he's good. Now you say, well, that's sort of simple to say God is good. Well, when you think about it, he's good in all ways. Hallelujah. Not only is he good, but he is a good father. Amen. Our God is a good father. You're more real than the ground I'm standing on. You're more real than oh, yes. the wind in my love. Thank you. Thoughts define me. You're inside me. You're Worship right now, come on. We're his, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Thank you. Uh, 
Come on, sing it now. Abba, I belong to you. Thank you, Jesus. Abba. right now. Thank you, You're Jesus. Good, good this is what he it's is. Who you are. Oh, it's yes. who you are. It's who you are. Thank you, Lord. It's who I am. today never escapes me that you could be somewhere else but you chose to be here and I'm so thankful for that and I know that the Lord will bless you someone say amen um, I want to bring your attention to Acts chapter 5 verse number 1 this is again a very familiar passage of scripture to Bible readers Acts chapter 5 I'm going to begin reading at verse number 1 and today I've chosen to read out of the King James Version it reads like this, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and bought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While as it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men rose and wound him up and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. And Peter said unto her, How is it 
that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord. Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the men came in and found her husband and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all things, came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Someone say amen to the, pre- to the reading of the word. Amen. For just a few minutes today, I'm going to speak to you about something I feel God laid on my heart over the last couple of weeks. I want to talk to you about terms and conditions apply. Terms and conditions apply. Brother Billy Hollowell, I love you, my brother, and I'm thankful for your love for this church. I ask you to pray that the Lord would anoint this message this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Someone say praise the Lord. Praise Give the Lord. the Lord a hand clap of praise before you're seated. Thank you, Lord. 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 You may be seated. I believe I heard Brother Billy say something like, let the word of the Lord come to us and help us. And that's one thing we need to try to do is let the word of the Lord help us. The Bible, we can read the Bible and we're doing that now, reading it through the New Testament through the year. And it can be just words on a page like we, need a, we read a novel that we find in the library. Or it could be something that inspires us, something that helps us, something that moves us. And the power to make that happen is not in God's hands. The power to make that happen is in your hands. So let's do that every time we read and every time we hear the word of the Lord. Someone say amen. Terms and conditions apply. For about 20 years I worked in the... Uh, newspaper advertising business, and my job was to approach businesses and attempt to get them to advertise their goods or their services in the newspaper. One of the things that I was taught early in my newspaper career was that if an advertiser stated something in their ad that was especially enticing or maybe even seemed too good to be true, then there probably needed to be a note somewhere in that ad about terms and conditions that apply to the offer. When uh, Patty and I moved to Georgia 14 years ago, we decided that we needed new mattresses. And so while I was looking for the best deal, I saw an ad that stated no payment, no interest for three years. I thought, wow, what a deal. I, I can sleep on a new mattress for three years for free. <laughs> Woo, exactly. Now, Brother Blake, that sounded to me like for three years, I could take that money that I was going to spend on making payments on these mattresses, and I could spend it on something else, and I could sleep on new mattresses mattresses that's what it sounded like until I read the terms and conditions that applied to that offer the truth was that if we did not completely pay off that purchase before three years then they would go back to the very first night that we slept on those wonderful new mattresses and they would charge us all of the interest to finance those mattresses. If we had not paid those mattresses off before that three-year deadline, we would have paid enough interest to buy a brand new queen-size mattress. The offer sounded great. The offer may sound great, but you better make sure you know about the terms and conditions that apply. When it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, when it comes to what was done by our Lord to redeem our lost souls, there was not then, 
nor will there ever be any terms and conditions. God's grace, God's forgiveness of our sins comes to mankind with no, with zero terms and conditions applied. The fact that God does and that God will show even the vilest of sinners mercy is not something that mankind did anything to earn. Man did not and he could not do a single thing to merit God's forgiveness. That forgiveness, that mercy that favor was purchased for us when Jesus Christ hung on a cross and gave his life so that we could be free from the chains and bondage of sin. Amen. Praise God. All that a man or a woman or a young person has to do is with sincerity and with honesty ask God to forgive them of their sins and immediately sins are forgiven. Someone say amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There are no terms, there are no conditions that apply to the forgiveness of sin. But, hear me now, but... When it comes to the deep relationship with our Lord that we have available to us. When it comes to the Spirit of the Lord anointing and moving in our life. When it comes to having the baptism of the Holy Ghost lead us day by day. When it comes to God meeting our natural needs. When it comes to the Lord fighting our natural and spiritual battles. When it comes to living an overcoming life in Jesus Christ. When it comes to all of that, this this book tells me that there are terms and there are some conditions that come into play. Amen. 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 Did she say amen? That's good. Say it, sister. <laughs> Teach her amen. I need them sometimes. The text that I read for you is, a, is an excellent, excellent example of what I'm talking about. A man and a woman sold a piece of property that they owned. And during that time in the New Testament church, it was common that Christians would come together and they would sell their worldly possessions and they would put everything that they had into the work of God and their earthly needs as well as their spiritual needs would as a community be taken care of. It was a natural thing to do. It was not a commandment. It's not what Jesus told them to go and do. It was just something that they all started to do. So Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold their property and they brought what they said was the entire proceeds from that sale to be put into the common fund of that church community. Now, it's important that you understand what is happening here. Ananias and Sapphira were obviously believers. They had repented of their sins. They had been forgiven. They had been baptized in Jesus' name. They were Christians. They were already a part of the church family. But they, they decided to bring money to the church and they decided to lie and say that the money that they brought was all of the money that they got from selling the property. Now here is where my preaching today comes from. As blood-bought, born-again Christians, there are some things that the Lord expects of us. That's right. Think of it like this. If Jesus Christ is going to have His anointing covering our life, then there are some things that are just not acceptable for us to do while we wear the banner of Christian. There are some terms and conditions that apply. Ananias and Sapphira show us that one of the terms and conditions that applies is that you cannot be a liar and expect God to overlook it. 
Ananias came in first. Verse 3, Ananias, Peter asked him, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds of the land? Wasn't it yours while you possessed it? And after it was sold, wasn't it at your disposal? Why is it that you planned this thing in your heart? You have not lied to people, but to God. And when he heard these words, Ananias dropped dead, and a great fear came all who heard. Sapphira came in next. Verse 7, about three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Tell me, Peter asked, did you sell the land for this price? Yes, she said, for that price. Then Peter said to her, why did you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out instantly. She dropped dead at his feet and when the young men came in, they found her dead, carried her out and buried her by her husband. Pastor, are you trying to tell us that if we tell one lie that God is going to strike us dead? I am not so arrogant that I would suggest that God will or will not do anything. That's totally up to Him. What I'm suggesting is that if we say that we are a believer in God, then there are some terms and there are some conditions that we need to be aware of that will cost us if we just ignore them. Can you get Kenley to say amen right now? I think I need one. <laughs> Levi, can you get Levi to say amen right now? <laughs> this book, this book is filled with terms and conditions. From the very moment that God decided to have a relationship with mankind, there were terms and conditions. God created Adam and he gave, them the garden, gave him the Garden of Eden. And that gift did not come without some terms and conditions. Look at Genesis chapter 2 beginning at verse number 15. And the Lord God took man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely. Now there's the terms. He said, Adam, you keep the garden and everything in this garden is for you to eat freely. That's the terms. Now here's the conditions, verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. From the man Adam, God puts into place terms and conditions that apply to his relationship with man. And of course, we know Adam blew it. I saw something the other day that read that Adam did not read the apple Terms and conditions. <laughs> Those of you with iPhones will get that. This book is filled with terms and conditions. And it's like never before Christians are ignoring things that the Bible clearly outlines at things, as things that are either sin or things that will cause our walk with God to suffer. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about a great falling away before the Lord returns. And honestly, I am watching as men and women and young people who profess a walk with the Lord, but yet the things that they do and the things that they don't do point to the fact that they, were, that they are falling away in their Christian walk. Even when it is preached, even when scripture from this book is given, showing that there are areas that we all need to reevaluate in our walk with God, still nothing changes. In fact, not only does nothing change, Brother Sean, but things seem to get worse. I truly wonder if right now we are in the great falling away that Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. I truly wonder. And, and what I think is the most frightening thing about what is happening today is that more and more those who say that they know the Lord treat him 
like they do the convenience store, like the Circle K on the corner. They prove with their actions that they're not really interested in a 24-hour, 365-day-a-year relationship with the Lord. But like the Circle K, which never closes, which is open when they need a gallon of milk, which is open when they need a few gallons of gas. Like the Circle K, they expect God to be open and to be available to them whenever they need a healing or whenever they need a financial blessing or whenever they have a special need. And they, unlike the Circle K, which makes you give something, which makes you pay money for what they give you. Anybody ever, you ever walked out of a Circle K with a gallon of milk without giving them some money for it? No, because you would be in jail. But unlike the Circle K, which makes you give money for something which makes you pay for what you get, those who believe that with God, no terms and conditions apply, they expect to use God like a vending machine that you don't have to put anything into to get something out of. Let's see. I need a healing, but, but I don't put any prayer time in. ka -chink. Come on, God. Heal me. I, I need a better job, but I don't put any fasting time in. ka -chink. Come on, God. Give me a better job. I need a financial miracle, but I don't pay tithe on a regular basis. ka -chink. Come on, God. Make the money rain. I need you to save my family, Lord but I treat getting together with my family in the church like it is just an option. ka -chink. Come on, God, perform. Sometimes we treat a Snickers bar better than we treat God. At least we're willing to pay for a Snickers bar. Amen? But with God, we expect Him to perform with zero investment from us. With God, we expect him to perform with zero investment from us. Let that sink in for just a minute. There are terms and conditions that apply if we want our God to be mindful of us. The Apostle John in 1 John chapter 3, verse 22 wrote that, Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now that sounds like that the Lord expects us to keep his commandments and to do the things that are pleasing in his sight. And when we do, then God will be mindful of us and of what we ask of him. That's what the Bible says, y'all. That's not me preaching. Someone say amen. amen. Right. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number six. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now that sounds to me like that the Lord rewards those who seek him. And it sure is hard to seek God if you never talk to Him in prayer. I guarantee you that I could ask those who really believe that God is real and that they say that they know Him. I could ask them, is God more important to you than your spouse? And immediately they would say, yes, God is the most important thing in my life. Many say that but they treat their relationship with God whom they say is the most important thing in their life much worse than they treat the relationship they have with their spouse. Even the dumbest of dumb will tell you that a marriage is on a collision course for failure if there is no communication between husband and wife. 
So if you care about your marriage, you will try to work to keep that line of communication open. But keeping the line of communication open, praying on a regular and consistent basis is not something that needs to be done to please their God. Paul wrote that God rewards those who seek him. I was, Patty and I had to go to Jacksonville yesterday because my sister was getting married. And as we were driving back, a song came on the radio, and I don't even know what the song was. I don't know a whole lot about the contemporary songs, but the gist of the song was, I'm glad that God pursues me. And I said to my wife, that's what's wrong with the world today. They expect God to pursue them instead of them pursuing God. Think about that. Paul wrote that God rewards those who seek Him. That sounds like God expects us to speak Him and then and to seek Him. And then when we do, then God will be mindful of what we ask of Him and reward us again. That's what the Bible says. It's not me. Someone say amen. Amen. I'm preaching terms and conditions apply today. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. According to this book, if we want the good and acceptable and perfect, perfect will of God in our life then we need to stop conforming we need to stop living like the world and we need to start living a life that is holy living a sacrifice holy living sacrifice to our God 2 Corinthians 7 and 1 having therefore these promises dearly beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God Friday morning two weeks ago I was sitting in Hardy's at about 5.15. Yes, there is a 5.15 in the morning. (laughs) I was sitting in Hardy's at about 5.15 and I was eating a gravy biscuit. And I had been praying that morning, asking God for direction in many things. But sitting in Hardy's, I started to ask myself a question. I said, am I preaching a holiness message in this church that will help everyone who goes to this church go to heaven? Am I preaching that type of message? And am I preaching the right message about holy and righteous living? I know I'm preaching the gospel, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. I feel really good about that. What I lay awake at night praying about is, am I preaching a message of holiness and righteous living that is preparing the church for heaven? Or are we just a glorified community gathering? Sitting there, thinking about that in Hardee's, I started to weep. As I was wiping my eyes, I thought, man, those ladies must think I really like this gravy biscuit. (laughs) It tastes so good that it makes me cry. But I was asking God to please, please help me to preach the message about holy living that he wants me to preach. And sitting there in Hardy's on that Friday morning at about 5.20 a.m., 
I believe that God spoke to my spirit. And he told me to tell all of us this. Hear me now. As we make decisions, as we consider the things that we do, as we consider the things that we lead our family in, as we consider the things that we allow our children to do, as we make those decisions, we need to remember this, and I'm telling you, if God has ever spoken to me, he spoke to me about this. As we make those decisions, we need to remember that on the surface, the things that we are doing may not appear to be sin. We might be able to justify away this act. We might be able to justify away this allowance that it's not really sin. But what is happening, and hear me now, What is happening is by us doing that act, by us allowing that questionable thing, we are training our flesh. We are allowing a side of our flesh that is powerful and will one day challenge our spirit to commit a thing or an action that clearly is sin. And we'll not be able to resist it because we have allowed our spirit to become comfortable with the things that are questionable in our life. We've allowed our spirit, our spirit to become comfortable with sin in our life. And all of a sudden, before we even realize that it's happening, we don't have the spiritual power that we need to walk away. We don't have the spiritual power to say no to sin. And then Satan begins to whisper in our ears, don't worry about how you live. God doesn't really require you to live a life that is different from the world. God God doesn't really ask you to live a life above sin. You can sin and still go to heaven. That's what Satan starts whispering in the ears of those who have allowed questionable things to become constant in their lives and their spirit has become used to it and now they don't have the spiritual power. Satan tells them there really are no terms and conditions that apply. If you want God to move in your life, there really are no terms and conditions to apply. If you want a deep spiritual relationship with God, There are no terms. There are no conditions. And saints of God who once were strong, who once lived a holy life, who once prayed, who once would fast and read their Bible, who once would come to church, even though they felt a little bit down in their body, they become so weak spiritually that they no longer can even recognize the voice of God that's trying to move them and nudge them in the right direction. And precious men and women and young people who were once mighty saints of the almighty God now find themselves in a lost condition. They can't even recognize it because they become comfortable with sin in their life. I want this church that I founded that I pastor to be a church that loves each other and feels like family. That's important to me. That is important to me. But I cannot and I will not be a pastor, be a shepherd that does not preach that in order to live an overcoming life, in order to live a victorious life in Christ, in order to live a life that will end up with us missing hell and going to heaven. We must, we must, we must live a life above sin. It's the only way we'll make heaven because terms and conditions apply. Let's stand.
I don't want to be misunderstood today. When it comes to forgiveness of our sins, there are no terms and conditions. God's love, God's mercy, God's grace toward us is unconditional. But when it comes to living a life that keeps us victorious, that keeps us overcomers, that keeps us saved, then there are terms and conditions that are contained in this book. And we can't just keep the ones we like and tear a page out and throw it away because I don't like that one. I'm just going to get rid of it. We can't do that. We must believe and abide by them all if we want to be saved. Terms and conditions apply.